All right, good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to Math 261, Applied Calculus. We're gonna be uh, with each other from 6.30 p.m. until about 9.20 p.m. Uh, each Monday evening, except for next Monday. Next Monday is a holiday, so we'll have one class together and then we don't have to see each other for two weeks. It's kind of uh, funny how that works out, but that is the beast of a Monday night class uh, each semester. So we're gonna spend about an hour talking about the syllabus, talking about how this course works with it being on Zoom and everything. And then after that, we're going to actually get into some material today. I do like to take a five to 10 minute break about halfway through each day. Uh, and when that's going on, I'll, I'll let you know and you can you know, do whatever you have to do, but please make sure that you are back in time when we start everything up. I'll always say what time I'm going to start things back up during the break. And if there's ever a chance to end class a few minutes later, uh, a few, excuse me, a few minutes earlier, not later, <laughs> why would you do that, Mr. Beckner? <laughs> if there's ever an opportunity to end class a few minutes earlier, I will try to. I know it's a lot to do in almost three hour class uh, Monday nights after the long weekend and everything, but at least I give you a break in the middle. Uh, not all teachers are that nice. I know I didn't used to way back in the day, but I learned my lesson. You lose everybody's attention after about two hours. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to just say one or two things that are up here, and then I'm going to go into the syllabus, and then we'll show some stuff in my math lab, like how to register for it, uh, where things are located, what things look like. Uh, we'll show you what Canvas has for you as well. All right, the first thing I want to mention, uh, and hopefully all or most of you received an email from me, if you enrolled in this course, in this course since like 3 or 4 p.m. yesterday, then you would not have received an email from me. However, there's a copy of that email in Canvas that I'll pull up later. And the most important aspect of that was that you have to enroll in my math lab, the website that we will be completing our homework and tests on, no later than 7 p.m. tomorrow, or I will delete you, also known as withdrawing you, but you get a tuition refund. Um, and I am 100% serious on this. Uh, this is a calculus class, so hopefully this is not going to be an issue. In fact, I already know that 11 of the 18 of you have enrolled, so that's really, really awesome. So I only have to worry about six or seven of you right now. I do have the course ID up here, so make sure you write this down. Uh, if you have not already, Beckner 56062, that is also listed in Canvas. It's in the it's on that little email thing I sent. It's also in the syllabus that was emailed to you, and if you didn't get it emailed to you, you can find it in Canvas. Uh, one thing that is expected of you it, with each three credit course over a fall or spring semester, you should be studying about six to seven, studying and doing homework for about six to seven hours each week. Um, and that's not to say that you'll have to. There are plenty of A students that can probably get away with only doing three or four. They're just aces at everything. There are plenty of students who uh, might struggle with calculus and need to do eight or nine hours and put in more effort. But this is just kind of the ballpark average, say two hours outside of class or every one hour inside of class. So this is in addition to watching the, we'll say two and a half hours of lectures each week. So please understand the expectations of you. If you're not completing your homework, you're not studying, you're not doing your tests, you're making D's and F's, and you're only working for like two hours each week outside of class, that's on you. You're not putting in the effort that you were supposed to be <clears throat> putting in. Um, each homework in my math lab, that's going to be due one week after assigned. Uh, whatever grade you have, as long as it's a passing grade, so a D or higher, I will add 10 points to that, except I won't go over 100. So in other words, if it says you have a 65, you really have a 75. And I'm not gonna change that in my math lab. You'll wanna keep track of that on your own, make it your own little Excel file or keep track of it however you'd like. So your my math lab grades are gonna lie to you a little bit. They also don't uh, account for zeros. So a student might only do one homework assignment all semester. They get a, that, let's say a 75 on it. My math lab is going to tell them they have a 75 homework average, which is probably really like a five or a six or a seven because it's not accounting for all the zeros. I can't fix that, unfortunately. So you need to understand how to average your own grades. Add them up, divide by the number of grades. So if your my math lab homework says you have a 65, it's a 75. If it says you've got an 82, it's really a 92. If it says you got a 95, it's really a hundred. Again, I'm not going to go over 100. I don't do that for tests, just homeworks. Again, homeworks are always due one week after the section is covered. So if I say, all right, we finished 1.1, you know it's due in a week. That due date will be reflected in my math lab uh, as it's covered. 
I don't try and anticipate the completion of assignments ahead of time because sometimes things uh, take longer or uh, less time sometimes even to complete. So I usually have a good idea of where things will be, but you know, nothing's perfect. Plus who knows when we'll have a snow day or something like that. Uh, when the tests are coming up, I will always give you at least one week of prior notice to if I can, and there will always be reviews provided in my math lab for those tests. So the review and the test will be in my math lab. The tests will have to be taken on your own time. We will still hold regular full two and a half hour lectures on test days. Now, because I record my live lectures and post them on YouTube, which will be linked to Canvas, that means if the only real free time you have is during our class, you could certainly take the test during class as long as you catch the lecture at a later time. And it usually takes a couple hours for everything to convert on YouTube. So I, I always post immediately after class, but it might not be up until like 11 p.m., something like that. Uh, I will give you a three day window, generally a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, unless I, I deem that something else would be, uh, be more fit, but I don't anticipate that. I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is gonna be the perfect window of opportunity. You will need to complete your work with pencil and paper or <laughs> typing if you really wanna go that way with math, good luck, uh, best of luck to you. I know there's tablet programs you can use for that, but uh, I really do prefer pencil and paper. You'll take a picture of your work and you'll submit it in Canvas. You'll see the appropriate links. We'll show that once it's a little more appropriate uh, and time-wise. And you have to do that within 15 minutes. And that's how you're gonna get potential partial credit. So maybe it says half your answers are wrong, but maybe on a bunch of them, you had, I don't know, six of the seven or eight steps correct. I can go back and give you partial credit if you have work that reflects it. If you don't have work that reflects it, you don't get anything. Also, if you don't show any work for your test at all, I reserve the right to give you a zero on your test because this is a calculus class. How are you going to do this test without showing some kind of work for at least some of the problems? Maybe there's a couple you don't have to show your work for. That's okay. But most of these problems, there's gonna be a decent amount of work because calculus. Speaking of, if you're rusty with your algebra, you're definitely going to need to de-rust. I have a couple of review assignments on things like factoring and exponent rules and stuff like that built into Canvas, but this isn't really a course where we get to review too much algebra material, too much pre-calc material. We do get to review some things, but not everything. So if you're weak in certain sections, you're gonna have to go back on your own time, maybe hit the tutoring center's uh, Zoom hours, which should be emailed to you in a couple of weeks once I have them, along with the, the link for their Zoom uh, meetings and everything. But yeah, uh, you will definitely need to de-rust on a lot of your pre-calc stuff. Factoring, we're gonna be factoring constantly throughout the semester. So that might be a big one for you. We're gonna be doing some graphing. We're gonna do a lot of rules with exponents. We will get to exponents and, uh, ex sorry, exponentials and logs uh, pretty quickly as well. There will be word problems. A lot of people get terrified by calculus, but it's actually the algebra that's the hard part. So again, make sure you de-rust. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the syllabus. Uh, that's not the syllabus, this is the syllabus. So Monday, 6.30 to 9.20 roughly uh, in the virtual Zoom, uh, Zoom room, <laughs> the room Zoom. Uh, you, I, you do have my office phone here, but I honestly don't know if I'm gonna be allowed in my office this semester or not. This first week, I'm not. I'm kind of anticipating us to not be allowed for like a month thanks to this Omicron variant just exploding everywhere. Uh, all my in-person classes that were Tuesday, Thursday have been temporarily moved to Zoom, which uh, I don't know about y'all, but I really miss in-person classes, like really, 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 really miss it. This was supposed to be my first semester back in the classroom after two years. And now I'm kind of terrified that my Tuesday, Thursday in-person classes aren't going to be in-person. That's not a problem for y'all, but I just didn't want to do my full semester on Zoom, but I will certainly take it if I have to. So what I guess what I'm really trying to say here is if you don't like learning on Zoom, I feel for you, I understand, I miss seeing your faces in person, which by the way, my webcam is terrible. My setup in my office is terrible. So that's why I don't have a webcam. Um, I also have one of those at-home living situations like I'm sure a lot of you do, where I'm not really gonna be available to, to talk and do this live for two and a half hours. There's gonna be a lot of people making noise, animals, things like that. So I am going to rely on some recorded material here and there, like today, this intro for about an hour talking about the course I'm going to do live, uh, but to kind of account for other people. 
I'm going to have the material for some review stuff. And then 1.1, that's going to be a recording. But while the recording's playing, I'll be in front of my laptop. I'll be in the chat room ready for you to answer any questions. And that's the other aspect I need to talk about. Uh, I do keep everyone on mute. Uh, my first semester with this, I, I tried having it so people could be on the mic, but uh, there was always feedback. There was always a lot of background noise. Uh, people's technology just wasn't as good as mine, no offense. And I know mine's not perfect. <laughs> uh, I know my volume can kind of go up and down here and there between my two different mics. Um, so if you ever have any questions while the class is going on, what you'll have to do is go up to your Zoom menu, click the chat button, and then you can ask it there. You can either send it to everyone so that everyone can see the message. Or if you feel like it needs to be private message to me, you don't want to know what uh, want other people know what you're asking, then you can private message as well. So there, I just send a message that says, hi, hello, waves, all that good stuff. So again, uh, whenever there's recordings going on, you can, at, even when I'm live as well, you can ask your questions there. And uh, if I am live, I'll answer out loud. If it's a recording, then I'll answer in the chat so you don't have to interrupt. Another reason I like to use recordings is because it really helps me keep on pace. Uh, that was another issue with uh, students and their microphones. I was, my quantitative reasoning classes, I, I didn't even finish the last chapter uh, this semester. I was interacting with everybody vocally. So I'm sorry that if you don't like that, um, the good thing is there are other teachers that teach this class. So if you just absolutely hate not being able to get on a microphone uh, to talk to me, you have other options. So that's just one of my, the few real sticklers I have. So again, office phone, probably not the best thing to call me. Probably, I don't know if I'm gonna be in there, um, but email rbeckner at tcc.edu. You can also shoot me a message through Canvas. I'll get back to you within one business day if you hit up the TCC address. If you send it to Canvas, I don't check that every single day. I try to, but some days I forget to. So it might be another day. If you email me on like a Friday afternoon, I might not get back to you till Monday morning. I don't always check my work emails. I'm teaching 21 credits this semester, which is really, 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 um, I've never done it before in my 15 years. So it's a little overwhelming, but uh, oops, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. That just happens. Uh, there we go. I don't even know how I fixed it. Office hours are still TBD. I will let you know when I have them. All right, prerequisite, you are supposed to have passed pre-calc one to be in here. You don't have to have pre-calc two because we're not gonna do any trigonometry. So if you have not passed that prerequisite, eventually TCC should figure that out and boot you. So make sure that you are where you're supposed to be. Required course materials, you are going to need a computer with internet since we're Zooming. You are going to want to have a graphing calculator or at least a really good uh, scientific calculator. Graphing would be much better. Uh, because we will let you use calculators here and there for tests. Maybe not every test, but definitely most of them. Um, I, think the, I think it's the first and second that I don't allow. It might just be the first, but don't quote me on that. Uh, I can't remember right now. I've been teaching since 9 a.m. today, so my brain is uh, fizzling out. It's been a long day. All uh, right. So again, scientific calculator or graphing calculator. The textbook purchase is actually the physical textbook is optional. You don't have to have a physical textbook because with the My Math Lab access code that you do have to buy, there is an electronic text and it's pretty easy to find. I will show you that in a little bit after we talk about the syllabus. So if you don't feel the need to have a physical book, you can save yourself a little money. I prefer physical things, but uh, the ebook is the exact same thing. So if you're fine with that, then it's fine. So pencils, paper, uh, the My Math Lab access code, you'll have a 14 day free trial. So basically by next Monday's class, if you haven't purchased that, you're gonna get locked out of doing your homework and your tests. You're not gonna be able to complete anything and you will get withdrawn because of that. Because as I'll say again later, attendance is tied directly to your homework because I can't mandate everyone be in the live lecture because I have the, the, the YouTube recordings available. All right, topics, learning outcomes. What are we gonna do? We're gonna talk about the three basic concepts of calculus. Basic is probably not the right word, the three general concepts, which are the limit, the derivative, and the integral. Two of those things are actually opposites of each other, and one of them leads to the other. So the first thing leads to the second thing, and the second thing is the opposite of the third thing. 
So calculus really does just fold into itself. It's one big giant concept ultimately that leads to a bunch of different formulas and applications. Calculus is a wonderful concept. It is the study of change. So we're gonna talk about things like, oh, back in algebra, you could figure out the slope of a line by using the slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Well, what if you wanted to find the slope at a singular point? Well, we would need calculus to do that. And it might sound kind of crazy, but uh, when we build the concept, it definitely feels crazy. But by the time we get to the formulas, you're like, oh, that's an easy formula, this ain't so bad. All right, so chapter one, differentiation, limits and derivatives, basically. Chapter two, more derivative stuff. I'm not gonna call all, all of these. Chapter three, applications. Chapter four, integration. Chapter five, applications. Chapter six, if we get to it, uh, well, actually we should get to it, functions of several variables. You'll see a lot of sections get omitted. We actually omit some material from each, from some sections as well. There's a rough outline of the schedule, and uh, unfortunately, these haven't been updated to reflect the fact that we just cut a week from our semesters. We added like 10 minutes to each class for a Monday night class, and that cuts a week ultimately. So this is not going to be perfect, but it will be pretty close. The first week, we'll pretty much knock out 1.1 and, and get pretty far into 1.2, but maybe not exactly finish it. But you get the idea of roughly what we'll be. But honestly, just watch the lectures and you'll see where we are. I think that's the best thing to know. Uh, but roughly two sections a week, two sections per class. I do have this set up for four tests. I may cut it down to three, I may do four. I have experimented with both in this class. I think given that we only meet once a week, I'm a little more prone to doing three tests, but don't hold me to that. And then your final exam, the final exam will be cumulative. So that last week of class, that last Monday will just be our final. And that one, you will not have three days to take your final. You will only have one day because we won't hold regular class. So the final is the exception to that rule I mentioned earlier. The final you, uh, you can take during class because I won't be holding class. COVID policies, I think this should be pretty normal for everyone at this point, unfortunately. Um, fortunately, we don't have to worry about you not coming to class if you're sick or anything like that. Um, if you're tests are interfered with because you're sick, you can let me know. Doctor's notes are required to get makeup tests, um, but I will certainly uh, do that for you if necessary. Grading policy, uh, the typical 10 point scale. So a 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, final grades will be available in my TCC or SIS, whichever you wanna call it. Do not email me asking for your final grades. I'm not allowed to tell that over email. I'm not allowed to give test grades over email as well. Um, you just have to wait to see the updated score from my math lab. The nice thing is when you take your tests, you'll get your score immediately. But if you have partial credit, uh, you won't find that out until I have done so. And you look at your grade and notice it's been updated. How are your uh, grades going to be calculated? So I'm actually gonna read these backwards. Your homework is gonna be 20% 20, 20 of your uh, score. I say quizzes, honestly, I don't anticipate doing quizzes in here. Uh, the only time I'll do quizzes is if I notice that everybody was showing up 30 minutes or 40 minutes late for class, and then I'll start doing quizzes at the beginning of class just to kind of get everybody here. But with Zoom, it makes it a little more awkward to enforce that policy, especially since I've, like I said, I don't actually require you to be at the live lecture. I would prefer you at the live lecture, but I know that some of you might not be able to be here for the full two and a half hours or at all occasionally. So as long as you're keeping up with the homework, that counts as your attendance. So homework is gonna be 20% of your grade. Again, I don't anticipate quizzes. It's just there as a safety net. Your final exam will also be 20% of your grade. Then the three or four regular tests will make up the other 60%. So if we do three tests, that means they will be 20% each and everything is basically weighted all the same. If we do four tests, then each test is weighted just a little bit at 15% each to hit that 60% marker. Um, please do not miss tests. I, again, will not give you a makeup test unless you have some kind of documentation for the reason that you missed the test. So if you just say, oh, I was sick, I'm going to go, all right, well, I need to see a doctor's note, and then I'll let you do that. Um, and that's just for administrative reasons. Uh, course communication, shoot me an email uh, outside of class. Please make sure that if you do email me that you say what class you're in. You don't even have to say the day and time. Just say math 261. That's all you have to say. 
So in the title or the body, make sure that you say Math 261. Again, I'm teaching seven classes this semester, and I have five different types of classes, so only two are repeats. So if you just say homework in the title, I'm not going to know what class. Hey, Mr. Beckner, I need, I have a question on homework number one. That's way too vague. Hey, Mr. Beckner, I'm in your Math 261 class. I've got a question on homework from uh, 1.2, number 30. I'm not sure what to do here. Homework in general, I really would prefer that you're working on, uh, on those on your own, especially because you have these help me solve this and do an example stuff. But on the rare occasion, I might be able to answer a question. Attendance policy, I've already basically said this, but uh, you, while you are supposed to be at the live lecture, I don't hold everyone to that. I'm not going to take attendance that way. Attendance will be homework completion. So if you miss uh, like five or six homework assignments, that basically means you're gonna get withdrawn because you're not attending class. You're not participating in class. So 15% means four days for this class. So if you, met, I'm sorry, uh, this is a Monday night class. It's only two days. So you're only allowed to miss two days. So if you miss a third day, I'm supposed to withdraw you automatically. Now, of course, if you were sick or something, there's exceptions there that I can make. Um, but again, just try and keep up with your homework. I don't really do homework extensions the first month of class, but if I see that you've been keeping up with your homework and you ask me one time, hey, Mr. Beckner, I need an extension on homework 3.2, I'll give you a few extra days. But again, I'm not gonna do it the first week of class. I'm probably not gonna do it the first month of class. You gotta prove yourself first before we, you, we can start you know, kind of skirting the rules. So again, make sure you're doing your homework any student, if, if we're four weeks in and I don't see any homework completed, then you're going to get withdrawn. If we're six weeks in and you've only done one or two homeworks, you're going to get withdrawn. And I don't want to withdraw anyone. I want every single one of you, all 16 of you here currently, plus the other two who aren't here. Um, I want everyone to get a passing grade, A's, B's, and C's. <laughs> all A's would be amazing. I'd love that. I know I, I can't expect that of anyone, but uh, that'd be pretty sweet to happen all the time. But just all passing grades is what I want. I never want any students to fail. I never want never want students to have to withdraw or be withdrawn. If you do think you uh, you need to be out of this course because you can't keep up with the material or the homework or it's rough and you need to try again, uh, it's preferred that you withdraw yourself. It's a lot of paperwork on the instructors to withdraw five or six students for seven classes. So I do prefer that you withdraw yourself. Um, but if I have to do it, I have to do it. Uh, late work, makeup work. I said late work and makeup work is not accepted, but then I also said that if it's two months in, three months in, you've proven yourself, you've been doing your work and you need one, you know, kind of extra chance, I can let that slide. But if you start asking me for uh, additional time every single week, that's not going to happen. Classroom behavior, really not going to be an issue. Um, you're all on mute. I'm the only one that can talk. Just don't say any obscenities or mean things in chat. Be nice to each other. Play nicely. Um, let's all be nice, responsible adults. So that should be fine. Electronic devices. Uh, you can certainly use your cell phone as a calculator while you're doing your homework, but I don't recommend it because you're going to want to be familiar with the technology you need for a test, which is a regular calculator, when you're allowed to use those. Again, you're not necessarily going to have your calculators for the first test and maybe the second test, but you will for the later test plus the final. Inclement weather, if we ever have to uh, close shop because of snow or tornadoes or anything weird, uh, you should keep be getting messages from TCC. Sign up for TCC alerts if you haven't. I'll shoot emails uh, once I know. Uh, also, if there's ever a situation where I'm sick, I'll let everyone know that I have to cancel class as early as possible. If I'm, uh, if I'm able to, I would just put a recording together of previous semester's recordings of stuff. That way we don't fall behind because missing one class for us is missing an entire week. I really, really, really don't want that to happen. So if there's ever an instance where I'm just ridiculously sick and I can't run class, I'll try and put something together um, by the time class would be posted live, or maybe it would be Tuesday. So hopefully y'all can tolerate that. Um, every now and then technology sucks. So if for some reason you haven't heard from me, and it's 6.30, it's 6.35, it's 6.40, and class hasn't started, Zoom hasn't started. It's probably because my internet's down. Uh, about once a semester, I usually have that problem. Hopefully that's gonna be the daytime classes and not my long nighttime class. Uh, if that ever happens, you know, hang out for like 15 minutes, 
uh, just keep pop, throw your email up and see if there's a message from me that I can shoot really quickly on my cell phone. It is difficult to email everybody from my cell phone because I have to grab the roster via a spreadsheet. And I honestly don't even know if I can do that from my phone super easily. I've never tried. I might have to try that out one day just to practice. Do, 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 do. Uh, emergency shutdown, look out for TCC alerts and messages. Not too big of a deal. Withdrawal policy. We've already talked about how you can get withdrawn for not doing homework because that's tied to attendance. But besides that, should you choose to withdraw yourself, January 25th is the deadline to receive a tuition refund and March 21st is the deadline to receive a W. If you withdraw after that, you receive an automatic F unless you have some extenuating circumstances like you're having a baby or you're going to jail or you're moving to Canada, who knows? And I feel like you move to Canada, they still have internet there. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, hopefully it's not the second one. Nobody wants that. Academic integrity. I, I, it's cool if you want to work on your homework together. I certainly don't mind that, but your tests need to be your own work, your own handwriting. Again, that's part of why I ask you to show your work and email it to me, not email it, submit it in Canvas. Plagiarism, academic misconduct, all that goes together. This syllabus is 17 pages long and half of it's just repeating itself. I have no control over that. The, my input on the syllabus is very minimal. Educational accessibility, if you have any documentation through TCC uh, for accommodations, I'm supposed to be able to get that electronically nowadays, so you shouldn't have to email it to me, but you can certainly email me to let me know. Um, I do prefer that when the first test comes up that you send me a reminder, hey, Mr. Beckner, I'm supposed to have an accommodation for the test, uh, and I'll go, okay, yep, sure, I got you. I'll make sure that that's taken care of, just so that I don't accidentally forget. Again, 21 credits overwhelmingly long Mondays from 9 a.m. until 9.30 uh, p.m. basically without really much of a break besides uh, <laughs> shoveling some food down, <laughs> down my face right before this <laughs> as quick as possible. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so again, I should be able to access those forms electronically. Uh, if you haven't he heard from me, if you haven't seen that I signed your form after a couple of weeks, again, just shoot me a reminder and say, hey, Mr. Beckner, I, I haven't heard from educational accessibility. Oh, 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 my bad. Let me go up there because that's actually brand new. That just started last semester and it's an unusual website that we have to go to to get to. It. In fact, I need to find my email that has that website again. Uh, emergency procedures, bomb threats, tornadoes, fire, not really going to be an issue. We're not going to be on campus. Title IX, uh, no discrimination. We love you all equally. Library, whenever the campus opens up is available, their hours will be posted outside. The Learning Resource Center, aka Tutoring Center, I should have their hours in a week or two. And once I have them, I will shoot those to you as well as the Zoom link. Uh, if the campus opens up in person, they were available for in-person tutoring last semester. I'm assuming they would be as well this semester, but I'm not making any promises. And then we have a couple important websites here, Khan Academy and Purple Math. These are great resources for catching up on old material that you're responsible for. It's like factoring, which actually one or two of the activities that I have for you in Canvas thanks to Khan Academy. I love Khan Academy. They got lots of great resources. Many students love it. I haven't really played with Purple Math too much. Um, I've been sending out this link for like four years now and still have, and I keep forgetting about it. I need to actually check out that resource. I've heard good things, but I can't speak for it personally. I just haven't tried it out more than like five minutes. And then there's a whole bunch of other websites that you can check out on your own time. I don't want to waste too much time. Okay, so let's talk about my math lab. How do you enroll in my math lab? mymathlab.com. If you already have an account, you can sign in and then enroll that way. But even if you do have an account, you can just go ahead and click register now as a student. It tells you you'll need your email address. We prefer your VCCS email address, but you can use your Gmail if you like. I really don't care. I'm just supposed to say that. Your instructor's course ID, which has been provided to you multiple ways already. And then if you want to go ahead and pay for it, or if you've already purchased your access code, one of those things, if otherwise, you can have your free trial that I'll show you how to get to. Okay, register now. Type in your course ID, which is Beckner, and then 56062. 56062. Continue to register. If you have an account, this is where you can sign in again. 
If you don't, then you'll hit create. I'm gonna pretend like I don't. You'll type your email address here. So this might be something like jbob0001 at email.vccs.edu if you're using your TCC account. Make sure you get this part right, because if you miss a C or you miss the email or anything else, when you go to sign in, if you use the correct labeling, it's gonna say you don't have an account. You're gonna freak out and you're gonna to talk to tech support and they're gonna say you don't have an account. And then you're gonna freak out even more because you paid for this and now it's saying you don't, oh my God, what happened? It's because you made a silly typo. Every semester this happens to at least one student and it's annoying for them. And I don't want that to happen to you. So let's pay attention and let's make sure we get it right so that it doesn't happen. I think I've only ever had one semester where nobody made the mistake and that's saying a lot. <laughs> Um, username can be your email or you can make it whatever you want. Password, re-enter your password, write these things down. I can't retrieve your password for you. I can get your username or your email. I think it's one or the other and I don't remember which one, but I can't get you your password. You would have to deal with password retrieval system or tech support. First name, last name, security question and answer. Click the appropriate boxes, especially the agreeing to the terms. Now, I don't wanna make a duplicate account, so I can't take you past the screen, but I can draw up what it looks like uh, if I can find my magnet pen. Go. So after this screen, after you click create an account, it's gonna take you to a page that looks like this. In the top left of this page, you'll have a button that says, use your access code. So if you already have that little booklet, then you can click there and type in those 25 letters. If you wanna buy it through my math lab, which is probably a few dollars cheaper, than buying from the bookstore because they got to make their profits. If you want to buy it directly from my math lab, you can buy the code here. You can use PayPal or a credit card or debit card. Obviously, you can't shove cash into your CD player. That's not going to work. It's probably about $75 if you do it this way and probably closer to $100 if you buy it through the bookstore, but don't quote me on that. If anyone actually knows those exact prices, please feel free to share them in the chat and I will regurgitate them out loud. Um, but I will be trusting you with those numbers. And then down here, this is where I imagine most of you will be, is the, it'll say something along the lines of 14 day free trial. It's not exactly in those words, but that's paraphrasing. So it's small and it's blue hyperlink. Of course it's small because they don't want you to see it. They want you to go ahead and buy the code. Now, again, if you click that 14 day free trial, you'll go ahead and have access for two weeks. But after that two weeks, you'll be able to log in, but you won't be able to access the course materials. And if another week and another week and another week go by, that's three weeks of you not doing homework, that's gonna be the point where I would withdraw you. So if you cannot guarantee that you can buy this access code this semester, you need to withdraw so you can save yourself your money and take this class when you're ready. I'm sorry that there is a paywall for this course, but that's just the way college is, unfortunately. I know a lot of classes have you know free books and stuff, free resources, oh, is it OER, Open Educational Resources. This is not one of them. The Portsmouth campus doesn't rely on that too much. I think it's Virginia Beach and Norfolk that do a lot more of the OER stuff. And I don't even know if there is OER material material available for 261 or not. There might be, but I don't um, I don't have any experience with it. Again, this is probably where most of you will be. And then once you do that, you'll have access to my math lab. And when you log in, it'll first look like this. So math 261. Monday, 6.30 p.m. When you go in here, uh, this syllabus is gonna be an old one if it even exists. So don't get your syllabus from here, get it from Canvas. I'll show you what Canvas looks like. Yeah, this, is, uh, this was from 2019. Uh, it's really annoying to have to have the syllabus emailed to you, then put in Canvas. Also have to put it in another place uh, that you don't see, then I have to put it in my math lab as well. So just ignore the syllabus in my math lab, go to Canvas for your syllabus. I'll show you that after. The main tabs you'll spend time in are your assignments, your gradebook, and your e-text. So assignments. This is an odd beast of a class in that they have integrated reviews, skills check quizzes before you actually have access to the chapter's homeworks. These are not graded, but what they do is, if you're really, really, really good at stuff that's gonna be in that chapter already, it'll trim the fat on some of the problems. So maybe there's 15 homework problems normally in 1.1, but if you did really well on the skills check, maybe it cuts out four or five of those problems and it means less work for you. So these little green flags mean you don't have access to that stuff yet because you have to do the skills check quiz. 
These R1, R2, R6, R7, et cetera, these are review material problems, stuff like factoring, stuff like exponentials, stuff like logs, that like I said, we don't necessarily teach you in here. Oh, how do you graph a linear equation? Uh, you can, you know, you can do an X and a Y intercept. You can plug in two random X values. You could solve this for Y so that it's in slope intercept form and use the slope and the intercept to plot a point, rise and run and all that jazz. There's lots of different options for that, but I'm not teaching you that in here. You're supposed to already know that. Graphing Y equals X squared, uh, whatever that said, minus one or plus one. Point by point sketching, point by point sketching, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we're not teaching that. You have to do it on your own. R3. Interval notation. Oh, I, I forgot how to do interval notation completely. Well, you're going to have to remember it. We will be using interval notation quite frequently in this course, especially when we get to chapter two or three. I can't remember which it is. Uh, we changed textbooks a, a year or two ago, and the chapters and sections got jumbled up a little bit. So I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Again, long day, but I will, of course, know ready to go to that section. So interval notation is just a pair of numbers separated by, separated, by, separated by a comma surrounded by parentheses or brackets. So you look at this and you think, oh, maybe it's bracket uh, negative two comma five bracket. For some reason. Oh, that's wrong. Okay, and I'm just gonna type the same thing three times. Pretend like I tried three different answers and I got it wrong. Three times. After the third time, it's gonna tell you what the correct answer is. Oh, it was parentheses, not brackets. And that's because it was marked as parentheses on the number line. So, oh man, I've got that question wrong permanently. Nope. You get similar question and you get another attempt. So maybe just from that, that little quick thing you learned, oh, it should be negative three comma nine. So parentheses, negative three comma nine, close parentheses, check it. And I got it. All right, cool. Next question. Well, maybe you didn't actually get it. Maybe you, you tried again and you got it wrong, you got it wrong, you got it wrong. Or maybe you just want to say, all right, I need help. So you don't email me. You have these two buttons here. View an example, we'll drag you by the nose through an example just like this and teach it that way. And you can take notes along the way if you want it. Well, the shaded area runs from negative six to four. Continue. The interval contains all real numbers from the left and right endpoints. Use a parentheses to indicate the endpoint is not included. So parentheses, it means open. It means every number up to negative six, but not negative six. And since that says a parentheses, the interval notation would be exactly the same. Blah, 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 blah. So the interval notation is negative six to four in parentheses, close. And maybe that would teach you enough to do this problem. Or maybe you wanna do this interactively and actually answer stuff instead of just reading it. A lot of people prefer this one, help me solve this. All right, the shaded area runs from negative three up until what number? Well, it looks like nine. So this time I actually have to interact. Got it. Blah, 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 blah. Does the shaded area include the point negative three? Well, that's a parentheses, so we said no. Bracket, it would. Cool, we got it right. Does it include the nine? That's a parentheses, so no. And if these shaded all the way left or right, those would be negative infinity or positive infinity. We'll see a lot of that as well. So the interval that describes the graph, well, it looks like negative three comma nine. Close the parentheses on each side, check it. We got it right. Okay, now when we do that, if I hadn't already solved this problem, what would happen is this problem would change and the number line might go from like negative six to positive four or something like that, or negative seven to one. So it would give you a different problem. But because I'd already done it correctly, it didn't show that. All right, well, I got it right, but I don't feel super confident. I wanna try a very similar question. Hit this button, similar question. You will retain your correct credit. It won't take that away, but now you can try it again. All right, I think I'm getting this negative four in a parentheses comma up to seven. Close the parentheses, check it. I feel a lot better. Now let's try the next one. Oh, this one looks weirder. That's an X and an X plus N. Ooh, help me solve this. Uh, the shaded region runs from X to, well, this isn't a number, but it counts as being a number, X plus N. Okay, fantastic. And you know what? This probably won't change because it's so generic. Um, so. Does it include? Yes. Does it include? Yes. So what's the answer? It would go bracket X comma X plus N, close bracket. In calculus, we get weirder things like that here and there. All right, close. 
Oh, it did change. All right, see, the, this changed to a B and this changed to a B plus T. Well, I think I got the concept now. So bracket B comma B plus T. Parentheses, right? Oh, nope, that's gonna be a bracket. Check it, we got it right, and now we're good. Very cool. So again, the review material stuff here, you don't have to complete. If you get 100s on it, it's not gonna help your grade. If you get tens on them, it's not gonna hurt your grade. If you don't do them all, it's not gonna hurt your grade. You'll have to do this. You have to do the skills check for chapter one as well as all the other chapters as they happen. And then when you complete that, the flags will open up and you can do the regular homeworks. And again, the better you do with the skills check, the less homework problems you will be responsible for. So that's kind of a cool feature. Now, just like we saw before, you can still hit similar question and have access to the ones that you got for free if you want to try them anyways, which I suggest. Then you can go over your grade book to check your grades. I'm not doing so hot right now, but I also haven't spent very much time. By the way, I do have the option, the ability to see how much time you spend on all this stuff. <laughs> I'm watching you. Uh, yes, of course, the regular homework is how your grade is calculated. So skills check and the skills check review those don't count it's only things that say section that count for your grade so chapter one one two three four five six seven eight sections chapter two one two only two sections we skip 2.1 wow this textbook is weird uh chapter three there's four sections chapter four there's four sections etc cetera, etc cetera. all right so how about that ebook? I said there's you don't have to have the physical book. Let's see what the ebook looks like. Chapter R. So the review chapter that you can cover on your own time if you like. Let's see what R2 looks like. Watch a presentation. No, nah, that doesn't sound like it. View the e-text. That's probably it. Also, everything in the study plan is not graded. You can do that stuff if you want. I honestly don't manage that. So I don't really know 100 percent what's in there. I look at some of it, but not all of it. But I do know the homework's inside and out. So this is your textbook. It's just electronic. Got some domain and range stuff, talking about functions, talking about whether something is a function or not, finding function values by using function notation, that f of x stuff. We'll be doing cool things like f of x plus h minus f of x over h. You should have seen that in pre-calculus. We'll take that up a step as well in, in this course and sooner than later. Oh, vertical line test for functions. So all the stuff in the R material, the chapter R material, again, you're supposed to know inside and out. A lot of this stuff will come up. So you have an interactive My Math Lab homework. You have the textbook available to you. But in addition to that, in the Canvas course, some of the stuff that I think is super important. So this is what your Canvas course looks like. So this pre day one email I mentioned earlier with the My Math Lab code here, and just in case. So if you did not get an email from me, this is exactly what was said in it. Blah, 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 blah. Required to watch lectures. Blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, I accidentally have something in here that shouldn't be us. The text is optional, but the workbook is highly recommended. This is not for us. That was for my math 154. I don't know why I forgot to cut that out. Ignore the thing about the workbook from the email. Once again, ignore the thing about the workbook from the email. I do apologize for that. We said, make sure you sign in for my math lab by 7 p.m. tomorrow. Enroll using the Beckner and the five digit number. It only takes like five minutes of your time. Super easy. Beckner 56062. I'd also given you the Zoom link, which was also just sitting there in Canvas. So here's your link to the class live along with the password. So sometime tonight after class is over and I've uploaded to YouTube, you'll see a link below it. And that will be the YouTube link for everything you've seen tonight. So in case you miss it or in case you want to watch it again or just five minutes of it, maybe replay a small section, whatever. And then after the second week, two weeks from now, uh, you'll see another link to YouTube after that class is done. And again, uh, the link might go up at like 10 o'clock, but it might not finish converting until about 11. Uh, it might even take longer than that because it's a three hour class almost. Uh, so the longer the video, the longer it takes to convert. All right, so review material, factoring. This is just a document that I, I made with some basic factoring formulas, the binomials, difference of squares, sum of squares, uh, which it doesn't actually have a formula, it's prime. Sum of cubes and difference of cubes. So you were expected to memorize those back in pre-calc. 
you're still expected to memorize these in Calc. Then an example uh, using one or two of those, uh, how to factor a trinomial where the leading coefficients of one, nice instructions, something I call the shortcut method. Um, and it's a shortcut of the AC method. Um, some people call the AC method grouping. So instructions, then an example on how that works. And you'll see me do some factoring in class, but again, I'm not gonna take hours to teach it. Uh, what if the leading coefficient isn't a one? Well, I like the AC method. If you like trial and error, a lot of students are good at trial and error um, and a lot of students aren't. So maybe try out the other method if you know one, but not the other, maybe you'll learn both and like both. I love both. I use trial and error more on my own, but as a teacher, I use the AC method more because it's more consistent. If there's 20 options for a trial and error one, you might not get it right till the 18th or 19th or 20th try. And that's not even that fair to you because you didn't know. But the AC method, you're gonna get it done in four steps no matter what. All right, blah, 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 blah. Factor by grouping for four-term polynomials, instructions. There we go. So some good stuff on factoring. Let's go back. Then I've got two links to factoring, uh, some practice with factoring. Again, there's some examples of this in the My Math Lab. These links are to Khan Academy. Let's look at the AC method one. I'm not gonna do any, but they give you an example. They talk about how to do it, they show you example very liberally, summary, and then they give you a, a question to try and answer on your own and you can check and it's interactive. So this is pretty nice. I have something up here for exponent rules. So what do you do if you have something like x squared times x to the fifth? Oh, you add the exponents. What if you add x to the fifth over x squared? You would subtract the exponents. Um, and there's actually a couple different ways you can uh, do that one based on where the bigger exponent is. What if you do if you have a fraction raised to an exponent? You distribute the exponent. If you have something raised to the zero power, that means it's one. If you have a negative exponent, you flip it. Again, this is all stuff you're supposed to know and then some basic examples, and maybe you'll find more examples in the My Math Lab assignments in chapter R. Ooh, radicals, square roots, cube roots. What do we have here? And again, you also have the material in the textbook for chapter R. So some basic radical rules, talking about how, how to deal with radicals and denominators, uh, dealing with uh, multiplying by conjugates when radicals are in the denominators, and a sum or a difference taking things like the square root of 50, where you can't actually take it, but you can break it down to something simpler like five square root of two. Once again, all stuff that is review material. Rationals, which means those bigger, goofier fractions with variables in them, x plus three over x minus two. How do you simplify them, factor or reduce? How do you multiply or divide them? How do you add or subtract them? How do you solve equations involving them? All that stuff. So this is very short and sweet and to the point. But again, the textbook can go into more detail. Uh, the homework can go into more detail, but it's better than nothing. I thought it was just a nice addition that I made for everybody. Uh, didn't need to go that far back. All right, so that is it for Canvas. Let's see, we have talked about my math lab extensively. We showed the textbook. I didn't show what uh, an actual chapter we start with looks like. Let's see what 1.1 looks like. E text. So when we start, uh, so today's lecture, the first like 40 minutes, I will do a quick review of some things and it's gonna be quick. Let me tell you, it's gonna be quick. But then we'll get into 1.1 and that's where the true calculus starts. We start talking about limits. We'll see this arrow notation with little pluses and minuses above the numbers that look like exponents, but they don't count as an exponent. Well, that's weird, right? It's actually pretty simple. We go into these little, you know, getting closer and closer to a value. Like we talk about X approaching 2.25. Uh, so we have to do evaluations of 2.24, 2.249, 2.249. 9, 2.2499999 without actually ever doing 2.25 necessarily. Sometimes we get to use it, sometimes we don't. That's what we talk about the idea of a limit. It's like playing the I'm not touching you game with your sibling. You get as close and close as close as possible without, without, without ever actually using that value. So again, this is what our textbook looks like. I do encourage you to look at your textbooks. I know reading a math textbook can be difficult for students. They're not the most user-friendly but it's a good idea to put your eyes on them because you're gonna see a lot of familiar material. 
they can prep you for the lectures. All right. We registered. We took care of my math lab. If anyone has any syllabus or my math lab or Canvas questions, go ahead and ask in the chat in the next like 60 seconds. Uh, and if not, then we're a couple minutes ahead of where I thought we would be. We can go ahead and get into the material. <clears throat> And we got everybody but one person. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. Again, I wish we could have done this in person, but I'll take what we can get. And I hope that y'all can accept the Zooming <laughs> without getting a case of the Zoomies. All right. I'm not seeing any questions. So like I said, we're going to start with some basic reviews. We're going to talk about the very, very basics of graphing, one or two of the things that we saw review material on very quickly. That's going to be about 40 minutes worth of time. And I think we'll do our break probably near the end of that. I thought about holding the break until Let's see, it's been 50 minutes so far. That puts it an hour and a half. That's that's a long time to go for a break. I'll probably uh, do our break in about 30 minutes roughly, but you'll it'll be very obvious when we do our break. All right, so let me set that up. So basics of graphs, we have our standard coordinate system. When it's important, I'll get a ruler out, which is extremely difficult using a tablet flying blind. I'm looking at a screen and I'm writing on a, a tablet and it's, it's, not, it's not a tablet that has a screen. It's just a black slate. <laughs> so if I try and do a line, like if I wanna hit, let's say I wanna do a line between this point and this point, just connect the dots. I have to put my mouse on the first dot, take my phone to it, make sure I don't pivot that spot, then take my pen and put it over the other one at the same time, then moving, I'm using my phone as a ruler, <laughs> in fact, if you didn't catch that. Um, and you know, that worked really good until I came off my phone and you can see what happened. <laughs> Point being, please, please bear with me when we're doing anything with graphs. I will do the best I can. I already don't have good handwriting. Using this blind technology makes it more of an adventure. So sometimes I'll just try and spitball it a, you know, a little better. So x-axis horizontal, y-axis vertical. If you wanted to plot the point, let's say three comma five, the first number is how far left or right. The second number, is how far up or down. We have our negatives to the left, our positives to the right, negatives below, positives above. So three comma five is just going right three and up five. I don't have to label every hash mark on an axis. I can just do that because if that's a five and I see five marks, I know they're going one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then let's have another point. Let's have this one be negative two comma four. So I gotta go left one, two. I'm doing my best to keep these evenly spaced. That's negative two, negative one, negative two, four. That would be right here. And then let's say, connect them to form a line, which means connect and extend. And I'll do a different color. So I'm just gonna do this without a ruler, without my phone, as best as I can. Actually, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. Sometimes my palm catches a little more on this slate. Fortunately, there's an undo button. There's, there's a line. That's a graph of a line. And then with that picture, we can see its slope. We can interpret intercepts, all sorts of good things that we can do. Um, but normally, you're not just given two points. You're told to graph a line, maybe something like 
2x plus 5y is equal to 10. And you have dozens upon dozens of ways to graph this. You can use random points. You can use intercepts. You can solve for y and use, sorry, not point, slope intercept. method. And there's hundreds of methods after this, maybe not hundreds. <laughs> there's more methods than this, but these are like the three ones. And when I say random points, I don't say you just get to pick the point negative two comma four. You only pick an X or a Y value. I really like the intercept method for this one because it's not solve for Y. Intercept method means start with a table, and that's not a question mark, that's a colon. Start with a table of values that looks like this. So the black numbers are what we start with. One time I'm gonna let the X be zero, one time I'm gonna let the Y be zero. So when you plug that in, you plug it into the original equation. I'm gonna plug in the X equals zero first. So that's two times zero plus five Y equals 10. Two times zero is zero, so that's just five Y equals 10. And then you'll divide both sides by five. I don't always show this much work in an, a calculus class for basic stuff, but it's an intro day and we get y equals two. I'm gonna put that number in blue. So we started with the zero and we found the two, the two. The cool thing about lines, and this is not true of all equations, if you plugged in y equals two, you'd get x equals zero. All right, now let's try plugging in the y equals zero. So that's two x plus five times zero equals 10. Five times zero is zero, so that goes away. <clears throat> we get two x equals 10, divide both sides by two to get x equals five. So that point is five comma zero. This, this is a table of values. That's the same thing as having points zero comma two and five comma zero as coordinate pairs. Nice thing about intercepts is they're gonna be sitting on the axes. So zero comma two, that's left or right zero and up two. There's our first point. Five comma zero, that's right five. One, two, three, four, five, and up or down zero. Connect with a line. I'll do this one in orange. I'm gonna do the best I can, best I can, best I can. My math lab, all you do is just click the two points using the line feature and it'll make that for you. It's kind of nice. There's a graph. All right, as a reminder, uh, slope intercept form, let me go back to black. I also have a button on my pen that makes me mess up occasionally. <laughs> slope intercept form of a line is y equals mx plus b. This is probably um, the most favored form of a line because it's solved for y, which means it's easy to plug in x values. It's, it's set up as an input output function. So you're putting it in x's and you're getting out y's. And the number in front of the X, this M is your slope. It tells you how steep it is. And this B right here, this is your Y intercept. And it goes zero comma B. It's not just B, it's zero comma B. In other words, if you plug X equals zero in, if you plug zero in here, this whole thing would go away. And all you're left with is a Y value of B. So plugging in zero for X gives you a Y value of B. Really wish the undo would stop doing that now. Oh well. So slope is rise over run. Which is a formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. 
If you forgot those, remember them. There is not a day in calculus where we don't need this in our brains. And I'm not saying we use it every day. I'm saying you need it every day because you might need it today. You might need it tomorrow. You might need it Thursday. You might need it Sunday. Prereq knowledge means you're supposed to know it, not learn it in the class and then forget it. <laughs> that makes it fun, right? <clears throat> That's the challenge of math. When we teach you how to learn, use a period in English, we don't expect you to forget it uh, in, the, in the class where you're learning what a gerund is. Now, this class is all about the study of change. Slope is the first basic concept of change. So this right here, this is what sets us into calculus. This right here, this is change. It's a rate of change, in fact. Rate means fraction. Change means difference. Change, change. Old, new, old, new. Um, let's say your slope is equal to, and I want to do this in different colors, which makes it fun to type out, A over B. A will be, there we go. All right, let's talk about B first. This is what we call the run. This is how far you go to the right. Never left, only right. A, the top, is how far you rise. That's up or down. Oops, spelling is hard. how far up or down based on the sign. Up positive, down negative. <clears throat> so in other words, if you have a slope of say two, let's go two x plus three. Let's graph the line y equals two x plus three. So you could do random points. You can plug in x equals zero and x equals five or x equals one and x equals two or x equals any two numbers you want in the world. Find the y values, plot the points. You could also plug in y values and find the x's. You could plug in an x and then a y. You could do the zeros like before, but it's not my favorite method because the variables are on different sides. I like this slope intercept method. So we know our slope is two, but the slope needs to be a fraction so you can see the rise and the run. That's two over one. The bottom tells you how far right to go. The top tells you how far up or down to go. This is a positive two, so up. Now you don't start at the origin though like you're graphing a point. This is going to be from any given point. Well, we have the three, so our y-intercept, the b is three, which makes the y-intercept zero comma three. Intercepts always have a zero opposite the name. So an x-intercept has a y-value that's zero, y-intercept has an x-value that's zero. And if you look at the graphs, that makes sense. So we're gonna plot zero comma three, then we're gonna rise and run the respective numbers to get a second point. So I don't have to plug in x equals one or x equals two or x equals 10 to find another point. I need to insert a new page. Please work, I, I need to remember to, to hit enter a lot because word is funny. Yep, that screwed it up. Let's see, sometimes this will work, sometimes it doesn't. Ah. Sorry about this. Maybe mm. <laughs> frustrations. It might just be out of order now. Why won't you let me highlight everything and move it? I know I've done this in the past. Yeah, it's just moving everything lower and lower and lower. It's still pushing it. Okay. So we're gonna graph this, two x plus three. We're starting at zero comma three. <clears throat> and then from that point, we're gonna go right one and up two. So I'm just gonna rewrite that information here. Where are we, here. 
So y equals 2x plus 3. So we had the point 0 comma 3. That was our y-intercept. And the slope was 2 over 1. So we go right 1 and up 2. So we had the 0 comma 3, which is here. It's on the y-axis. That's what makes it a y-intercept. To be on the y-axis, you have to go left or right 0, which is why the x value always has to be 0. Now from that point, I'm going to go right one unit and up two units. So we're going to go right to one, and I'll show you the movement with a little dotted line. So this is me going right one, and then we go up two. Now I need to mark four and five on this to be able to go up two. So up one, up two. So right one, up two. There's our second point. Then we can connect them with a line. Nope, that's going to be bad. Let's try again. There we are. And there's our line. Mm, that area is a little ugly. So that's how we can graph using intercepts and slopes. Do you have to know that? No. But it's a great option to know the three primary ways of graphing lines, because we're going to be doing a decent amount of graphing throughout the semester, and lines are not what we're going to be graphing. We're going to graph some curves, and they're going to get more and more complicated as time goes. All right, uh, so that's what I want to cover from section R1. There's more material. Look at that homework once it's available <clears throat> uh, if you want to work more on it. Let's go domain and range. So now we're in the second section. Oh, come on. I have all these other pages and it just keeps doing this to me. Whatever. Sorry about that. I'll make sure this is set up better next time. <clears throat> domain. These are your inputs. Generally, your X values. Often listed in interval notation. Range. This is your outputs generally y values. Now, unless we're talking apples and oranges, we're talking dollars and, and quantities of items, we might not call them x and y anymore. We might give them more appropriate names. But when we're just dealing with your basic <clears throat> algebra and calculus principles, x is input, y is output generally. And then range is also often listed in interval notation. Functions have a certain condition to be a function. No input may lead to, two, to more than one unique output. Oh, that is, I don't want that color right now. back to black. So I said often listed in interval notation, not always. Uh, let's just say for this one, for this example, find the domain, the range, and if it's a function. I'm going to do this just as a table of values. This is kind of a unique problem. Something that we will not typically do in this course. So let's say we had x values of 0, <clears throat> 1, and 2, and then y values of 4, 9, and negative 6. And then another point, 0 and 4. The domain of this one, <clears throat> because these are finite elements, you do curly brackets, 0, 1, and 2. I don't need to list the repeat. You just list them each once. The range is 4, 9, and negative 6. They don't even have to be in order because of this type of problem. Now, when we're talking about regular functions that are continuous, <clears throat> their equations, things like that, this would not be okay. It would go to interval notation. This is not interval notation. Is it a function? Well, to be a function, no input may lead to more than one output. 
this point and this point are potential issues because it's the same input. But look at this, the outputs are the same each time. So yes, this is a function. It's okay to put in the same input and get the same output every time. What's not okay, spoiler alerts, is this. I'm going to skip the domain and the range. You, you should be able to do that on your own. The domain admittedly doesn't change, but the range does. But is this a function? Well, we have the warnings here. The warning is the fact that you have repeated inputs. That's a warning. It was a warning last time, but the outputs matched. This time, these are not the same. I don't know why I have two S's there. Just ignore that. This is one input having more than one output. So no, that's not a function. Um, for graphs, we have the vertical line test. Any vertical line may only cross the graph at most once to be a function. Again, I know I'm going quick because this is review material. But let's say, here's our graph. We got a parabola. So I have to be able to draw infinitely many vertical lines on this and all of them touch the graph only once each time or not is okay. That one touches once. That one touches once. That one touches once. And if I do that a million times, you would see that yes, that is a function. Let's take that parabola and tilt it on its side though. Now I can draw vertical lines on the left side. All of these are zero. These don't touch it at all. They're perfectly fine. So someone might say, yes, this is a function, but you have to consider everything. If you do this right on the Y axis, ignoring my graphical error, that would touch the graph one time and that's okay. So the left side's perfectly fine to be a function, but anytime you do this on the right side, which you have to consider everywhere, boom, boom, that touches twice. So no, that's not a function. Function notation. Looks like this. <laughs> f of x equals blah, 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 where blah, blah, blah is something like y, uh, like 2x plus 3, 5x minus 7, x squared plus pi x minus 11. I almost said 11d for fun. That blah, blah, blah can be simple or complicated, but can only have x's. This is basically the same as saying y equals, but with some added features we can plug in anything to functions, not just numbers. But if you had y equals, you can only plug in numbers. So if I have y equals 2x plus 3, I can only plug in numbers to that. If I have f of x equals 2x plus 3, I can plug happy face into that. I can plug sky into that. I can plug 42 into it. Function notation is better as well because it shows inputs and outputs in answers. So let's say we had <clears throat> y equals 2x plus 3 versus f of x equals 2x plus 3. Same, same thing on the right side. And I say, <clears throat> Evaluate at x equals one. Well, for the first one, you go y equals two times one plus three. I'll do a different color for showing the plugging in. 
which when you simplify that, two times one is two, two plus three is five. So you get y equals five, that's your answer. If you do it this way with function notation, the input goes where the x was. So this would be f of one. I'm just gonna go ahead and put the one on the right side for time's sake. And that would be equal to two times one plus three. Two times one is still two, two plus three is still five. So we get f of one equals five. In the first version, you only see the output. Here you see the in and the out. You see the full coordinate pair of one comma five. Now you might say, well, Mr. Beckner, I don't need function notation. It only took me a step. I can see the input right here. I plugged in one. Well, maybe this isn't a simple problem. Maybe it's lines and lines or pages and pages of work. Maybe your dog goes and eats all your work but leaves the answer. And I go, well, what'd you plug in to get your answer? Well, <laughs> if you use function notation, you're staring at it. If you don't, eh, go and do the problem again, right? Or maybe you just miss your points. I don't know. So that's our function notation. And again, we can plug in all sorts of things. We can do, instead of just doing f of one, let's, let's use that still. Let's do f of uh, z. So I'm plugging in z. I put little lines in the middle of my z's to distinguish them from twos. So that'll be two times z plus three. Now I can't actually do anything to two times z plus three. So f of z is two z plus three. Your answers can actually be polynomials and rationals and radicals and expressions instead of just numbers. Or I could do f of, this is something we will do a ton of for the first week, couple of weeks. X, f of x plus h. This is a very important concept. So now, instead of doing 2x, it's two times. And because I'm plugging in a binomial, I have to use a parentheses for that to make sure it distributes correctly. So this black ink was just the red X originally. We're plugging in what's inside the parentheses. There it is. But you can actually distribute that too. So F of X plus H is equal to two X plus two H plus three. Again, we're gonna see a ton of things like this in calculus and then do other stuff with it. If you had pre-calc, you should have seen that done before. And it goes to something called the difference quotient, which is the first step of calculus. Um, this H, we're gonna end up doing something with this ultimately, but for now we leave it alone. What is it? We'll talk about it later. Piecewise defined functions. They look something like this. F of X equals, then you get a little curly bracket. Now, not all textbooks and teachers do this curly bracket. Sometimes you'll just see it, two things stacked on each other. So let's say two X plus three here, and then I don't know, uh, 17 X squared minus 11 here. This is still a piecewise defined function but I really do prefer, and thankfully our textbook does as well, I like to have that curly bracket to just emphasize that these are coupled, these are going together. But this is not all the information. You can't just say it's equal to these two things, it would make no sense. You have to give limitations. You have to give restrictions on them. So you might say, all right, well, it's this thing when X is less than zero, and it's this thing when X is bigger than or equal to zero. So if I wanted to do F of one, I would use the top. Right? And I say right because I, I wasn't paying attention, but that's, I'm, I'm emphasizing here. That says to use when X is less than zero, but one is bigger than zero, so no, that's not right. I use the bottom. So that would be two times one plus three. I'm gonna skip the color change, which we already know is five. And I still did it, didn't I, right? <laughs> We're not using the top, we're using the bottom. 17 times the one squared minus 11. We're supposed to use the bottom because we're using the bottom when X is bigger than zero and one is bigger than zero. One squared is one, so that's 17 minus 11, which is six. So F of one is six. But if I wanted to do F of negative one, 
then we would use the top because negative one's less than zero. So that'd be two times negative one plus three, which is negative two plus three, and that's positive one. So f of negative one is positive one. And when you end up graphing these, I'm not gonna do the graph of this particular one. What they end up looking like, and they don't have to be lines, they can be curves, they can be anything. Sometimes you'll have one that does this, and then maybe you have an open circle here, and then you have a closed circle here, and then it does this. <clears throat> So piecewise defined functions are for when there's a radical change in how this thing operates at some point in time, at some point in the x values. So we're saying, all right, originally the function is doing this thing, but then all of a sudden something drastic changes and now we're up here and we're dropping. Maybe this is kind of like the stock market before March because of, well, you know what? So we were going up pretty well, not in a linear fashion, but we were going up and it didn't jump up here all of a sudden, but all of a sudden coronavirus hit and people were freaking out and panicking and they started selling so that it dropped. Again, I'm not saying this right here is the stock market, I'm just relating it to that. It was kind of discontinuous and how all of a sudden it just changed directions. But they don't have to be disjointed like that or discontinuous. You can have them, you can have an, you know, you draw this one and you make an open circle and then when you draw the other one, you might end up with an open, uh, with a closed circle, and then you do this. This left one is known as discontinuous because you have to lift your pen or pencil or marker or whatever off the paper or tablet and then go up here. But this one, where it has that drastic change, it's still connected. This is continuous. There's also the idea of one of these being differentiable or not, or both of them being differentiable or not. We'll get into that later, what that means, but that's a later chapter. Um, 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 um. I know that's a terrible <clears throat> habit to have. Domain and range. Inter All right, so on that note, I think this is the perfect time to have our break. This is about the halfway point. So at 7.52, so let's say at 8.02, we are going to start back up. So go ahead and take a breather, stretch your legs, whatever you have to do. Back at 8.02 on the dot, we will pick up exactly where we left off.
All right, let's pick up where we left off. And here we go. Interval notation. It always goes furthest left, comma, furthest right. And the comma is always there. Then surround with parentheses and or brackets depending on the problem. Parentheses mean included, which is a less than, greater than, or equal. It has the or equal part of it. Use brackets. I'm sorry, it does not. Ah, less than or greater than. I, I, I had brackets in my head. I was thinking one problem ahead. I got to be careful doing that. <clears throat> Parentheses mean they're not included. We said that earlier. I'm not trying to lie. This is correct now. Parentheses mean not included, which means the symbol was originally a less than or a greater than. And I'll show you an example. Brackets are used when you're included. So it has the or equal to. You always use parentheses for infinities. So if I had x is greater than five, if I was just doing a number line for this, Here's our five, greater than means we shade to the right. And because of the greater than without the or equals, we parentheses that. <clears throat> the interval notation though, which is gonna be on the far right side, we, we can much more easily lift off of the number line part. Now, if you practice this enough, you'll be able to do it without graphing the number line, but this is helpful very often. So the furthest left we see shaded is five. So that's the furthest left, comma, the arrow says we go to infinity, so five comma infinity. We always use a parentheses for an infinity, and because this was a greater than, because there was no or equal, we parentheses the five. But x is greater than or equal to five would look very similar, but with a bracket on the five because of the or equal, it is included. So that would be bracket five comma infinity. These are not the only types of interval notations. You can have x between two numbers. You could have negative three is less than x is less than or equal to, let's go with eight. It's the number line. You'd have negative three on the left. You'd have eight on the right. You'd shade between them. The negative three gets a parentheses. The eight gets a bracket because of which ones have the or equals or not. So that's negative three in parentheses, comma, eight in bracket. Okay, so how does that help us with domains and ranges? Well, let's go back to an example, finding the domain and the range, but of a graph now. Did I hit enter enough? Yes, I did. And let's just keep the numbers simple here. Let's go with a negative four on the left, a positive five on the right, 10 on the top and the negative three on the bottom. You know what, that five is in a bad spot. Let me just move it. There we go. Oh, I'm still on eraser. <laughs> so that's a five and I'm gonna put an open circle here. So this graph right here, this doesn't go to any infinities or anything like that. We're just finding the domain and the range. Domain is left and right because X moves left and right. Y moves up and down 
So your range is how far down to how far up. So this thing seems to have a highest value at 10 <clears throat> and it swings down and it swings back up, but it never goes below 10 and then it swings back down. In terms of left and right, it goes from negative four all the way to positive five. So our domain, again, we start at negative four and we're nice and smoothly moving until we hit the positive five. So we go from negative four to five, but then we need parentheses and brackets. Now a closed circle means included. This is having the or equal essentially. So the negative four gets a bracket. An open circle is like not having the or equals. It's exclusive, it's not included. So we can go up to 4.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
AX squared plus BX plus C. Now the A's, B's, and C's are just numbers. It's literally the same A in the two forms, but your vertex is not, not seen. So the vertex form is nice because you can tell where the lowest or highest point is immediately. The general form, you can't, you have to use a formula. H, which is the X coordinate, is negative B over two A. To find K, you just plug in the H value to get the vertex. It still opens up based on the sine of A. You can get additional points. You can use intercepts to get additional points to graph them, all sorts of good things. Now, we more often than not see things in the general form versus vertex form. We really will not see vertex form a lot in here, but you might see it once or twice. We're going to see things mostly in polynomial forms or factored forms. As a reminder, the quadratic formula. If you had me in pre-calculus, you heard me say a million times, you never get to forget it. Still true. For the same general form, so for f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, the solutions to this equation, if, uh, I'm sorry, for zero equals, when you set the function equal to zero, which is also known as finding the zeros of the roots or the x-intercepts, there's three names for that. The solutions to that, is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac all over two a. As long as you were in calculus, never forget this. Don't ever forget that. You need it, you need it, you need it. It can lead to real solutions, it can lead to imaginary solutions, rational, irrational solutions. Especially if you're not that great with factoring or if a problem is not factorable, which like 95 to 99% of real world problems aren't factorable. It's just mainly the ones we do in math class that are. But if you try factoring something that's prime, you got to fall back on this. We're going to need this frequently throughout this course. So don't ever forget it. I'd love to give a test where this was the only question, but I can't do that. All right, so that is it for the review sections. So just give me about 30 seconds and I'm gonna set up for where we will begin with the true calculus, talking about the introduction of limits with section 1.1. And we're actually gonna lump 1.1 and 1.2 in the same kind of uh, lecture because they just go hand in hand. And I don't really know why the textbook splits it up that way. One point one limits a numerical and graphical approach. And so I'm going to lump these together. This is not something I ever do again for the rest of the semester, I don't think. But honestly, these two sections should be one. I'm not sure why they're separate. So I like to teach them together. And I'm not saying I do everything all in the same moment. I just call this one section. And then 1.2 is algebraic limits. Uh, A, I see. I can spell. <laughs> and continuity. All right, so. The idea of a limit, before we get into that, we need some notation. We need this, uh, what we call approach notation. So arrow notation or approach notation. If you see something like this, uh, X and then an arrow and then a one, 
don't want to do that part yet. This says as x goes or approaches 1, as x goes to 1. That's the way that reads. But there's variations to this. You could see this as an x with an arrow and then a 1 with a little minus sign above it. And that is approaching from the left side. So this is as x goes to 1 from the left. Or if you have what looks like a plus sign as an exponent, that's as x goes to 1 from the right. Quotes. There we go. I guess I could have typed those parts out, but when you when you have the little drawings and then typing things, it gets a little weird. So that arrow notation is going to be critical, 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 because we're going to see it in every single problem, basically, uh, for the first several sections of this course. <clears throat> so that arrow notation is used in what we call limits. <clears throat> So we got notation. <clears throat> the limit L I M as X goes to C. Mm, that's a bad arrow. <clears throat> so the limit as X goes to C of F of X. This is the notation for the problem that we're going to call finding the limit. Finding a limit is seeing <clears throat> what a function is tending towards to, what the output is tending towards as our input is heading. So we're going to say, all right, we're going to let the x value approach 3. What happens to the y value? What is that approaching? And the idea of approaching is very important. Let me see if I can just type this out. Yes. So this states... Oops, I missed my equals L. This is not nearly as difficult to do in a traditional class. <laughs> so then what you'll have is you'll end up getting a number for this, maybe. So L is a number. <clears throat> so this says the limit as X approaches C of F of X. Again, that is read as the limit of f of x as x approaches c, or the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and it turns out to be the number l. So this states that the limit of f of x as x approaches c is the value l. <clears throat> C is a number, L is a number in general. This is the definition of a limit. The limit as X approaches C of F of X is equal to L. So the F of X would be a given function or a graph maybe, an equation, a graph, a function, anything. And we want to know, all right, as you go really close to one value on the X axis, what is it going close to on the Y axis? What is the function approaching? Now, this is the total limit. This is considering approaching from the left side and the right side, but we don't necessarily have to approach from both sides. We can approach from just the left or just the right. Let me go ahead and get some space just in case. I don't trust this too much. Okay. So the limb, the limit, as x approaches c with a little minus sign that looks like an exponent of f of x is equal to L. This is the limit as we approach from the left. Left only. You don't even think about the right half of the graph. You cut it out. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Or 
we can approach from the right. And I think that you can figure out what this would look like. You get a plus sign as your exponent instead of a minus sign. So this is the limit as we approach from the right only. Think about your number line. The negatives are on the left, the positives are on the right. The negatives are on the left, so if you have a negative as the exponent, you're coming from the left. Positives are on the right. So if your exponent's a positive, you're coming from the right. And I'm not saying we're heading towards zero. You could be, it just depends on what the number C is. <clears throat> All right. Limits, limites, limits can be finite, which means there is a number, an L, a three, a nine, a 12, whatever or they can be infinite, which we often say the limit does not exist if it's plus or minus infinity. Often, and this is kind of jumping the gun a lot, but I wanna go ahead and say this. Often we can simply plug in the x value into the function to get the limit, but it's not always so short or easy. <clears throat> All right. So this is our limit notation. This is the general limit where we consider the approach from the left and the right side. We'll have a function and we expect a number or an infinity is the answer. And this is just the notation. You put LIM in front of it to abbreviate for limit. I've seen some people just use an L, but it's kind of abbreviating too much. Maybe your teacher's done that in the past. <laughs> but sometimes you only think about the left or the right side. So if you're approaching from the left, you put a little minus as an exponent or a plus as an exponent from the right. And let's actually get into trying to use this. So for example one, let's find the limit as x approaches one <coughs> of f of x. <coughs> if f of x is equal to 2x plus 1, and we're going to do this by using tables, table of values. So our function is 2x plus 1, and we want to find out the limit as x approaches 1. A limit is like a game of I'm not touching you uh, between you know, two brothers or a brother and a sister or something like that growing up. You want to get as close as possible to the thing, to the number, without actually using that number. That's why I say often we can consider just that number, but it's not always that simple. I, I really don't want us to focus on this too much yet. <clears throat> Let's focus on the idea. So imagine me in front of you, and I take my finger, and I put it about an inch from your nose, and I go, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. And then <clears throat> I'm gonna put it about a half an inch from your nose and I go, I'm not touching you still. And then I put it maybe like a quarter of an inch or a 10th of an inch and I just keep getting closer and closer to where you can practically feel the tip of my finger on your nose, even though I'm 0.1 <laughs> micro inches away or something like that. Um, and that's kind of weird to use micro and inches together since micro is more of a, uh, another system, but that's okay. It would just be a ratio of an inch. So I would never actually put my finger to your nose. That's the idea of a limit. You never actually get to that point. You just think about what happens as you get to that point. And the limit of me saying, I'm not touching you and I'm not touching you and is you getting annoyed with me, that would be the limit. <laughs> but you know, we're gonna be doing numbers and not noses and, and talking about nosing and, noses and fingers sounds like something else. <laughs> You can pick your friends and you can pick your noses, but you can't pick your friends' noses, as they say. Sorry, had to do that cheesy joke. So we want to do a table of values. And this is what we're going to set it up like. I'm going to use red for the numbers we're going to plug in. Let's do an x value of 0.9. That's a terrible looking nine. 
Then let's do an x value of 0.99. Then let's do an x value of 0.999. And that'll be enough. So we're gonna throw these three numbers into the function and just see what happens. So two X plus one. I'll pull out a calculator just in the sense of keeping this simple. So each of these function values, I'll, I'll show the work for a couple of them. For these at least, uh, here we go. So F of, oops, black. Black, black please, thank you. F of 0 0.9 would be two times 0 0.9 plus one. And that would be two times 0 0.9 plus one. And you get 2.8. So that's 2.8. So that's what goes here. When we plugged in 0.9, we got 2.8. The F of 0 0.99. Well, that's two times 0 0.99 plus one, two times 0.99 plus one, and you get 2.98. And then F of 0 0.999 is two times that number, then the plus one, two times 0 0.999 plus one, and you get 2.998. Now you could keep doing this if you wanted. You could plug in 0 0.9999, and you'd get two times 0 0.9999 plus one, and you end up with 2.9998, 2 and you could plug in 0 0.99999, and you'd probably end up with like 2.99998. I had to say it right. Now, do you have to approach 0 0.9, then 0 0.9? Do you have to do it in this exact way? No, you could do 0 0.9, then 0.95, then 0 0.98, then 0 0.99, then 0 0.995, then the point is I'm getting closer and closer and closer to one. We started out a tenth away from one, then a hundredth away from one, then a thousandth away from one, and then I showed it but didn't write it. A ten thousandth away from one. And that function value, you know, when we were relatively close, it was 2.8. Then we were closer, 2.98, then 2.998, and 2.9998, and 2.9999999998, etc. The point of the limit is what number does it seem like this right column is approaching? So think about what number f of x is getting closer and closer to. Well, I think if you're very careful, if you think of a basic number that it's getting closer to, it's getting closer to three. So the limit as x approaches one now this is this is not the entire problem. This is only half the problem because 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, this is from the left of one. So earlier we had left and right side limits. What we are currently showing is this one because we're using numbers to the left of one, like 0 0.9 and 0.99. So I have to put a little minus sign as an exponent saying we're approaching from the left of our function is equal to three because that's the number we seem to be getting closer and closer to. Now, is this some type of proof? Is this absolute? In fact, no, it's not. But it's good enough in a business calculus class. It's actually good enough in an introduction to calculus class as well. Now, when you start talking 400, 500 level mathematics, you get in these things called epsilon delta proofs, which we won't even touch with a stick here. So that's the left side. Let's do the right side now. So let's go with, a table of values. Now we need to approach one from the right, so like 1.5, 1 1.1, 1 1.01, something like that. And let's just start with the 1.1, then we'll go 1.01, then 1.001, and you could keep doing this and keep doing this if you like. I'll show the evaluations this time one more time. So f of 1.1 would be two times 1.1 plus one which is 2.2 plus 1, which is 3.2. I don't even need the calculator for that. 
I didn't need the calculator for any of them. <laughs> but if you don't trust me, two times 1.1 plus one, 3.2. Then we can do f of 1.01, .01, which is two times 1.01 .01 plus one. That's 2.02 .02 plus one, which is 3.02. .02. Then we do f of 1.001. .001, that's two times 1.001 .001 plus one, which is 2.002 .002 plus one, which is 3.002. So this right here represents us approaching the function from the right side, approaching the value of one from the right side, that is to say, because we're using values to the right of one. I didn't mix and match. I only approach from the left and I only approach from the right when I'm doing these tables. So the limit of our function as we approach one from the right side, 3.2, 3.02, 3.002, it seems to be three. Now, in order for a limit to exist, these must match. The left and the right sides must match. The regular limit, not a one-sided limit. In order for the regular limit approaching both sides to exist, the left and right limits must match. If one of these was a three and the other was a five, there's no limit. You can say the limit from the left is three and you can say the limit from the right is five, but you can't just say the limits, is it three or five, which is it? And it is possible for a function to do that, especially with piecewise defined functions with what we call discontinuities, as we'll give that definition later. But we've already demonstrated that visually last time when we talked about piecewise functions in the review very, very, very quickly. So what we can say is the conclusion of this problem is, so the limit as x approaches one of our particular function is three because those numbers matched. <clears throat> and if you want to write what the function is, you can. You can say the limit as x approaches one of, and it was two x plus one, you can say that equals three. You can use the function notation or you can actually write in the function. <clears throat> Both of those are acceptable. So that's how we can do a limit with a table of values. You have to show the work for a couple of numbers from the left getting closer and closer to your value, a couple of numbers from the right getting closer and closer to your value. And then the limit only exists if those answers match. Is it tedious? Yes. Is it slightly time consuming? Yes. Is it a necessary evil? Sometimes. Are there quicker ways to do this? Most of the time, absolutely. So this was using tables, but we also could have done it by graphing. We could have also done this by graphing. So I'll pull out a TI-83 for the next problem. Um, let me pause my screen for a second so I can get that. I don't know why I paused the screen for that. That was silly. I didn't need to do that. Um, there's, there's one thing you have to pause for, and it wasn't that. All right, I gotta remember that. So the next example, we'll use our TI-83 for. Now, you are coming from pre-calculus, so you know, if you got a pre-calc course that was taught in the right amount of time, hopefully you learned how to graph rational functions in there. But still, it's not, it's not a skill I'm gonna heavily rely on in here for y'all, so. We'll just pull up the calculator for it. So example two, find the limit as x approaches or as x goes to negative two for the function x plus two over x squared minus four by graphing. This would be super tedious to do a table of values and actually show all the arithmetic and algebra. 
So we're just going to do this by graphing. So let's find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this function. This is our function x plus 2 over x squared minus 4. So by graphing, so let's just pull out a graphing calculator. Go to our y equals screen. This is a polynomial with multiple terms in the top and bottom, so parentheses are necessary. x plus 2. Close it, divide it by other parentheses. x squared minus 4. And I'm going to go ahead and spoil this. We're going to come back to this problem later. And then I can hit graph. And it kind of looks like a heartbeat, kind of looks like an impulse uh, electrical signal. But this represents a vertical asymptote. These old calculators aren't just going to automatically draw, draw the dotted line for your vertical asymptote. It ends up just kind of looking like this. But this function from the left of that number is going down forever to negative infinity. But then if you approach from the right, you'd be going up forever to positive infinity from the right side. So it's kind of a weird behaving function right there, which typically rationals have that kind of feature. But that's a positive two, and we're not, we're not interested in positive two, we're interested in negative two. So the limit depends on where you are. I could say, what's the limit as you approach five? And we'd be interested in somewhere over here. I could say, what's the limit as you approach zero? And we're interested over here. I could say, what's the limit as you approach positive two? And we would be interested in this weird negative infinity, positive infinity issue, which, spoiler alerts, that limit does not exist because positive infinity and negative infinity aren't the same number. But we're interested over here at negative two. So I can hit my trace button, and then I can type in numbers. So I can type zero, and we can see if we were to plug that in, we get negative a half, negative 0.5. We can see if I plugged in positive two, it says y equals blank because that's an asymptote there. That's a vertical asymptote. You can't plug two in because it makes the bottom zero and you're not allowed to divide by zero. It's one of the biggest issues we come across in math. You can't divide by zero unless you're like a quantum computer or something. And I'm not gonna get into those subtle details because I don't even know most of them. Um, so we're interested in negative two. Now, if I just type negative two, check this out. I said earlier that sometimes you just need to evaluate the function. But if I type negative two, it's blank. <clears throat> you might say, well, why is that? It doesn't have that asymptote over here at negative two. It looks like it's just going along. Well, if you plug negative two in the bottom, negative two squared is positive four, and four minus four is zero. It makes the bottom zero, so that number can't be in the domain. But it's not an asymptote, because that also makes the top zero. It's a common factor, and common factors that cancel are holes and not asymptotes. So that was an important issue from pre-calc one. It's an important issue that's covered in the review material. So if you're rusty with that, I, I just said it all, but you can practice with that in the review material. All right, so the point by graphing, we're gonna do the same thing as up here. Let's just not, let's not just plug in negative two. Let's do something like, you know, uh, negative 2.1, negative 2.1. 1, negative 2.001 and negative 2. Point, you know, or negative 1.9, et cetera, et cetera. So let's hit trace <coughs> again, excuse me. And let's approach from the left. So to the left of negative 2 would be like negative 2.1. So if we plug in negative 2.1, we get negative 0.243. So negative 0.243, negative point, I'm just gonna write these down, negative, I'm still gonna write the table of values. And then we'll do negative 2.01 and negative 2.001. And <clears throat> let me do this, come on. So I can see my calculator and that at the same time. Stop that, you silly computer program. <laughs> Why is it cutting that side off? Ay, ay, ay. Oh my Lord. I don't know why this is giving me such a headache. There, okay. So we typed in the negative 2.1 and we got negative 0.244. Negative 0.244. Okay, so let's hit negative 
to oops 2.01 and we get negative 0.249 and then if we do negative 2.001, <coughs> we get negative 0.2499. And we could do this again if we wanted to, we could go negative 2.0001. We get negative 2.499938. <coughs> so it seems like we're getting closer and closer to negative 0.25 which would also be known as negative a fourth. So this is the left-sided limit. This is from the left. And it seems like the limit as x approaches negative two from the left, I'm just gonna write a f of x here, is negative 0 0.25. If we do it from the right though, so we'd need something like negative 1.9 negative 1.99, negative 1.999. So negative 1.9. And that's negative 0.256. If we do negative 1.99, negative 1.99, this thing doesn't like quick double clicks. Negative 0.251. 6 there, because I got around the 0, 6 up to a 1. And then negative 1.999, we get negative 0 0.250. So 0 0.256, 0 0.251, 0 0.250. And if you don't trust this, you can go negative 1.999999. <laughs> and it even basically gets to that number of 0.25 because I, I've, it's, it even thinks, I, it even rounds it for me. So that's kind of weird because it says, now it says when I plug in negative two, I get negative 0.25. This is just a display round. It did not actually plug in negative two. It plugged in negative one point and then however many nines. It's just a display issue. So it seems from the right, and I forgot my, no, I didn't. I didn't forget the, the minus sign. The limit as X approaches negative two from the right of our function also appears to be negative 0.25. So that says, since those numbers match, the limit as x approaches negative two from either side of x plus two over x squared minus four is negative a quarter, 0.25. Which is super interesting because when you actually type in negative two, that output is blank because it's undefined because there is a hole. So this is one of the first fascinating ideas of calculus. So note, f of negative two is undefined. There's a hole there because the factor, because it makes top and bottom zero. Common factor, which would cancel out. If you simplify this, you could factor the bottom as x plus two times x minus two and then cancel it and you'd only have one over x minus two. <clears throat> but you have to use the original function when you're talking about restrictions and things like that. You can't reduce things because then you're missing information. So note that the function value is undefined and yet the limit exists. The number that we're approaching is different from the actual number we get. And this can be seen in all sorts of applications. So let me show you a couple pictures of some weirdness. And I'm just gonna stick these in the first quadrant to make it easy. Uh, let's have this graph right here. 
hold on, sorry, I got something happening here. I just dropped something. <laughs> Give me a second. Okay. So let's have this be our function, basically. Some random curve. But let's put a hole here and let's actually have its function value up here. And I'll call this value C, since we used C earlier. It could be any number. And then you have a height here of A and a height here of B. Now I'm gonna th do a couple variations of this function. So this one's got something weird going on. This one does not. It just has a normal point there. That's a height of A. And then let's have the same picture here. Oops, wrong mark, wrong mark. Have a hole here. Have the function value up here. This will still be our C, our A, and our B. But I also want to put a D over here with the exact same height as A. So this point right here has the exact same height. It doesn't look perfect because I'm not a great artist. I just put the D a little too far to the right. That's all. Here we go. Let's do this point here, and then that'll make the D here. And I know the D shouldn't come before a C. That's not the point of this. The first one, we're going to go just make a few notes. F of C is equal to B. It's a terrible looking C. F of C is equal to B. Because there's a hole here and it's shaded up here. So this is like a piecewise defined function. The function is this curve for everything except at that number, but then at that number it's up here. So the function value is the dot is the, the, the shaded point at a height of B, but the limit as you approach the same x value of the function is a, because as you approach this value from the left, as you approach from the left, you're heading to that point. As you approach from the right, you're heading to that point. This random jump cannot be told, cannot be seen when you're going, you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, 0 0.9999, or 1.1, 1.01, 1.001. 1. So the limit and the function value are completely different for that one. For this middle one, oops, back to black. F of C is A because it doesn't have that discontinuity jump and the limit as X approaches C of the function is A. Because when you approach from the left, when you approach from the right, you're still heading towards that. Now this one over here, I'm gonna do F of D. Well, F of D has a height of A, so that's there. <clears throat> but I'm not using C, I'm using D. And then the limit as x approaches d of f of x. So I would say most often than not, if you've got these weird little discontinuities, they're usually more interested in that section, but they don't have to be. And that's exactly what's going on in this third case. I'm interested over here. There's something weird going on over here, but that doesn't matter for the limit because we're interested in what happens from over here. Well, the height of the function is a, and as you approach from the left, as you approach from the right, it's also a. It had nothing to do with this weird section over here. Well, I didn't even need to know that for that problem. Whereas with the first one, I did. Let's say, let's do another one of these. Let's do another piecewise defined function. Let's say we had a little curve and an open circle here and then a closed circle here, and it was a line. Now 
and let's call this point C, and these heights A and B again. So let's only focus on the C, so for this one. F of C is equal to, well, is it A or B? Well, it takes the shaded one, it takes the B. Now, if we come from the left, we're approaching this height right here at A. So the limit as X approaches C from the left of the function is the A height. As we go left, we're approaching A. As we go from the left, that is to say, we're approaching that. But as we come from the right, we're on the line part instead of the curve and we're approaching a height of B. So the limit of F of X as you approach C from the right, this would be the B. These don't match, so the limit as X approaches C of the function does not exist. D and E means does not exist because they're different values. We're approaching seven from the left and 10 from the right, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me mute for a second. So in calculus, very often we're interested in what we're approaching and not what the actual value is. <clears throat> it's great when they're the same thing, but they don't have to be the same thing. <clears throat> uh, I am so sorry. So this is the graphical approach. This is the table of values approach, which are really one and the same. What about going back to the basic idea of often we can simply plug in the X value into the function to get the limit, but it's not always short or easy, and it's not always even completable. So let's go back to this problem, the two X plus one. So let's do the algebra version. For example one, can we simply plug in uh, <clears throat> the x value to get the limit? So that was the limit as we are approaching one, I believe, right? Yes. So we had the limit as x approaches one to the function two x plus one. Well, let's just plug it in. We get two times one, I'll show that, plus one, which is two plus one, and that's three. Which was the limit? So here's a question. If you can just plug in the number and get the limit, why wouldn't you do that? Why would you want to do this graphical approach? Why would you want to do this table of values approach? Why would you want to do all this ex extra work if you can just plug it in? Well, because this says often you can. It doesn't say you always can. When you have functions that have this type of behavior, maybe a discontinuity where we're interested in, or maybe an asymptote like we saw on that graph, or maybe a hole like we have on this graph, or this graph, or the one we saw earlier, maybe that's an issue. So what the takeaway here is, what you can do is just try plugging the X value in and see what you get. If it's a normal function, i.e. not piecewise, if you get a value it is generally the limit. But often functions are ill behaved at the value we are approaching. Hmm. So it worked for example one pretty well. 
if you just plug in negative 2 into this one right here, the x plus 2 over x squared minus 4, the top, negative 2 plus 2 is 0. The bottom, negative 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. And you get 0 over 0, which is known as the indeterminate form. It's both infinity and negative infinity at the same time, or one or the other. It, it can vary quite wildly, depending on the, the degrees of the top and the bottom, and a few other things as well. Multiplicities of zeros, lots of details. But, but just plugging negative 2 in here, it doesn't quite work. We'll come back to that problem in a little bit. For now, let's try some ones that may or may not work. Example 3. 3, that's an ugly 3. Find by evaluating if possible. So for A, we're going to do the limit as x approaches 5 for the function x squared minus 7. So what I like to do is I like to say, okay, well, let me just plug the 5 in and see what I get. So plug it in. We get 5 squared minus 7, which is 25 minus 7, which is 18. So because I got a value, that's probably right. And if you don't trust it, Let's just do the graphing approach really quickly for this. Uh, let me hide that because I'm going to use it again later, I think. And just put x squared minus 7 here. So this is the graph of x squared minus 7, something every single one of you should be capable of doing by hand because we taught you that in pre-calc 1. If you're rusty, practice. All review material is, or all prereq material is necessary. I want to say all, but most. So if we just hit trace and five, hey, there's a y value. That's a great sign. It's at 18, which I can't see. So I'm gonna change the window. I'm just gonna make the, the y maximum 20 instead of 18. That way I can actually see this. So trace, type in five, and it's right here. And visually it looks like as you're approaching from the left, that's where you're going. As you're approaching from the right, that's where you're going. But let's just try a couple numbers, 4.9, 17.01. Well, that's close to 18. Let's get closer. 4.99. 17.9. That's close to 18. You couldn't tell it was going to be 18 with 4.9, but now you might have an idea. 4.999. 17.99. Yeah, that's probably 18. Let's try from the right. 5.1. Yeah, 19. It's, it's off by one, but let's get closer. 5.01. Okay, I'm feeling a little more confident. 5.001. Yep, it's definitely going to be 18. So we are able to skip all that extra graphing analysis type of situation. This looks like an S. Let me make sure. Five. All right, so let's try another one then. Maybe, maybe it always works that nicely, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. The limit as x approaches 5 for x plus 3 over x plus 5. Now you might say, oh, this one's not going to exist because the bottom is going to be 0. Now if that was a negative 5 here, then you'd be right. But that's not what's happening. So let's plug it in. The 5 again. Same number this time. It doesn't have to be. That's just a coincidence. So that would be red. Five in the top, a five in the bottom, plus the three, plus the five. Five plus three is eight. Five plus five is 10. Eight tenths reduces to four fifths though. And because I got a value, that's probably right. If you want to confirm it with the graph. Parentheses x plus three <clears throat> divided by parentheses x plus five. Graph. Oh, I thought I covered the second one. That's all right, whatever. I only need to see one of these. And you can see over here at positive five, and you can use the left and right arrows to get closer. 
we're in the 0.8 ballpark. So that's a pretty good sign. If you do uh, 5.00001, let's just go ahead and get really close. 0.8 and then a bunch of zeros and a two. Well, that's ridiculously close to four fifths. So that's a good sign that, it's, that it works from the right. How about from the left? How about 4.999? 0.79998, yeah, that's pretty close to 0.8, which is 4 fifths. <clears throat> C, the limit. As x approaches, let's do a different number this time, 9. And we'll have the square root of 3x minus 1. So let's just try plugging it in. And we get the square root of 3 times 9 minus 1. 3 times 9 is 27. 27 minus 1 is 26. So we get the square root of 26, which, yes, it has a decimal approximation that I don't care about. I mean, we got a number, so that seems pretty good, right? And again, you can confirm with your graph. Square root. 3x minus 1. <coughs> <coughs> Close the parentheses. Let's go back to our standard window. So there's our square root function. No surprises. We showed you that basic shape last class again. And let's just type in 9. Oops, got to hit trace first. And we get 5.09, which guess what is square root of 26. Now, you're not going to be able to tell that graphically because it's an irrational number. So you would definitely have to do this one algebraically because if you type in, let's say, 9.0001, I'm going to guess that some people are going to think they're approaching 5 or 5.1. But if you do 8.999, Five point oh nine as well. It's not like one of them was five point oh nine and the other was five point one something. So that's a sign that it's a weirder number when the left and the right numbers aren't kind of sandwiching another value. So <clears throat> that would say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That would say you should probably go to the algebra, and that's because it's a square root function, and square root functions have very goofy outputs. Now I need to point out something. This function starts right here at an x value of one third. How do I know it's one third? Because if you set the inside equal to zero, if you find the domain of this square root, you set the inside bigger than zero. And that's all the x values you can use. You can't use anything less than one third. If I type, I do trace, one divided by three, you get an output of zero. If you plug that in, three times a third is one, one minus one is zero. So this is the very first point where the graph starts in terms of left and right. If I had tried to find this limit, it doesn't exist. You cannot find the limit at a third or anything to the left of it. Because check this out, if you're approaching from the left, the function doesn't exist. There is no left-sided limit because how can you approach something that's not here? You can approach from the right and approaching from the right, you are certainly hitting a y value of zero. So the right-sided limit is going to zero, but the left-sided limit, you don't know where you're coming from. Are you up here? Are you up here? If you up here, you're nowhere. So there is no left-sided limit. So be careful with square root functions. That's what I'm kind of getting to here. Where's my mouse? Be careful with special classes of functions like square roots. They do not have limits at the boundary where the function starts or where the function doesn't exist. So, if I, so for square root of three X minus one, if I ask you what the limit as you approach negative nine is, you can't plug negative 9 into this because 3 times negative 9 is negative 27, minus 1 is negative 28, and the square root of negative 28 is an imaginary number. Now, we can certainly do a billion things with imaginary numbers. They're not even imaginary. They exist. The concept that's imaginary is they're 
X intercepts. That's what doesn't exist. But imaginary numbers are very much an important aspect of the real world, science, engineering, physics, <clears throat> chemistry, biology, all sorts of good stuff. So again, the point of this is if I had done the limit as X approaches negative nine, that graph doesn't even exist. You can't plug it in because there's imaginary numbers. If I asked you what the limit as you approach zero of that is, it would also not exist because the left side and the right side don't match. So the limit as X approaches, I'm sorry, not zero, one third of the square root of three X minus one does not exist since the left side limit does not exist. The right side limit is zero. As we showed, the right sided limit is zero, but the left side limit doesn't exist because you can't approach to the left of something if there is no left. There is no spoon. <laughs> Outdated movie references, I apologize. Although I guess a fourth one's coming out. Maybe, who knows what's happening with entertainment, right? <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google, there is no spoon. I'm sure you'll figure it out really quick. It's actually pretty funny since that movie just came out. You can tell that, uh, like I said, these videos were from a previous semester. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call it a day there since there's only about 10 minutes left. And I believe the next example would take pretty much the entirety of that. And we made pretty good headway today. We got about as far as I wanted to. So again, make sure that you do zoom out. Make sure that you sign up for my math lab using that course ID. Again, I know at least 11 or 12 of you already had. So the last six or seven, uh, please make sure you do that by 7 p.m. tomorrow so that we don't have to remove you from the course. I do not want to do that. I want you here. Uh, besides that, I hope that this was a wonderful uh, beginning into uh, calculus for you all tonight. I hope you learned something. Go ahead and start working on that 1.1 and or 1.2 homework. Like I said, we'll give you the due dates for those uh, next time when we actually finish the sections, but it would still benefit you to work on any problems that you can since you do have two weeks. And if you think you can work past uh, that and try a couple other problems just using the help me solve this and view an example, go for it. Why not? I mean, wouldn't it be cool to be ahead of schedule? All right. So enjoy next Monday off. Have a good holiday. Email me if you have any questions. Take care and we'll see you in two weeks. Have a good night.